right, thanks, Jerry. Um, my name is Ivan Streznicki. I'm a technical fellow with Curtis Wright uh, Defense Solutions. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, a new VITA standard that we're introducing focused on 3U AFT or air flow through. Some of you might know that there are some uh, existing standards already in VITA that have to do with cooling. Uh, we've got ANSI VITA 48.1 and 48.2, which are the incumbent uh, cooling approaches for air cooling and conduction cooling, respectively. Uh, there's ANSI VITA 48.5, which is an existing AFT uh, cooling approach, and I'll be talking about the differences between what we're introducing today and that uh, ANSI standard. Uh, ANSI VITA 48.7 is another uh, air cooling standard that's available. And uh, last but not least, VITA 48.4 is a working group that's uh, looking at standardizing liquid flow through cooling. So uh, it could reasonably be asked, you know, why do we need another cooling standard with, when we have all these, uh, these great uh, cooling standards that have been released already? Uh, and I'll talk about uh, why we uh, need to do that uh, by getting into some of the details, not too many. I've only got about uh, 15, 20 minutes, um, but feel free to come and see me afterwards if you have any, any more uh, detailed uh, technical questions. So one of the details that, that we need to talk about is what's the fundamental problem that we need to, uh, to fix or to solve by applying new cooling approaches like air flow through. Um, if you look at the last five generations of embedded Intel processors, you look at uh, two parameters. One is the overall power dissipation. The second one is the power or heat density. Power dissipation itself has been more or less below 50 watts for those five generations which is a, a fairly high power dissipation by the standards of embedded processors, but it's, you know, we've been able to, to handle uh, th those, uh, those powers. The power density has been sub 100 watts for the, the first four of those generations, and we've been able to handle those with the traditional you know, incumbent cooling approaches like air and conduction. Uh, but the last uh, generation uh, of both embedded processors as well as server class processors, uh, we've had a very high uh, power density or heat density of around 200 watts per square centimeter which may not mean anything to anyone who's not a, a thermal engineer, but uh, if you look at how that compares to some things that we do know about, it's actually similar to the heat or power density of a, nu of a nuclear reactor. Uh, so, and you can imagine what kind of engineering feats are required to cool a nu nuclear reactor. The good news is that the heat density that we're talking about on, on processors is on a very small area. It's actually a, a, not even the full area of the die. It's a smaller uh, subsection of the die. So it's not as, as, as a huge a problem, but it's it, just to give you an idea of, of the power density uh, comparison that we're talking about here. So when I, when I uh, saw that comparison, it got me interested. So how, how do you actually cool a nuclear reactor? Um, so being an engineering geek, I went online, you know, did, did a little bit of research. Google's great. You know, within 15 minutes, you, you're, you're dangerously knowledgeable. Um, <laughs> I, stu I stayed away from the nuclear bombs uh, 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 links, just focused on the reactors. Well, it turns out that um, a large part of the cooling of a nuclear reactor is actually integral to the power generation function of a, of a nuclear genera uh, ge generator. Uh, the fission uh, reaction happens in the reactor. Uh, you have some very hot byproducts that are going to the, um, to the left here, and they go into a, uh, basically a vat of water which produces steam, uh, the steam goes to a turbine, goes to a generator, produces electricity for this small city. And then you've got a closed loop where you condense that water and bring it back. So uh, that was, uh, I thought that was very interesting. Unfortunately, electronics is, is uh, the cooling for uh, electronics is not so beneficial. Um, but there is some work being done in the commercial world uh, where uh, people are, are looking at thermo uh, thermoelectric devices to uh, harvest heat and produce uh, small amounts of electricity. So kind of a similar approach here. That's, that's something that we're keeping an eye on. So getting back to electronics, how do, how do we cool those high uh, heat or power densities in electronics? If you look at the typical stack ups that are involved in the traditional uh, air and conduction cooling approaches, uh, you know, you've got several uh, elements in series. You've got the, the heat producing dye. Uh, you've got thermal interface material, a TIM-1, you've got a heat spreader, you've got a th another thermal interface material, a TIM-2, and then a heat sink, either an air-cooled heat sink or a conduction-cooled heat sink. And you're, you know, at, ultimately you're going to bring that heat out to the ambient air, uh, you know, which is going to cool it. But you can imagine that each one of those thermal resistances, uh, if you want to cool really high uh, heat densities, you need to optimize each and every one of those. And that's exactly the approach that DARPA took 
uh, back in uh, the 2007 to 2013 timeframe, uh, they had a project called uh, TMT or thermal management technologies where they looked at each and every one of these thermal ele elements and put in place very, uh, you know, a, a wide array of requirements to optimize them and came up with some very neat technologies like nano spring uh, thermal interface materials and vapor chamber heat spreaders. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, or unfortunately, they can't, you know, there are, those, are, those technologies are available. Uh, to my knowledge, they have not been uh, commercialized sufficiently so that they're, they're, they're low enough cost for, you know, uh, reasonable uh, volumes and, and approaches. So we can, another option that we can apply to cooling these high power densities is to bring the ambient air much closer to the heat producing electronics. So it's a pretty simple uh, pr approach of AFT. Anyone who's been involved in this uh, has seen this uh, before. Um, but one of the interesting things or one of the different things we're doing here is that rather than having that parallel heat path uh, with conduction, uh, we're getting rid of that and we're allowing just the air to do its job of, of cooling. Uh, that helps from a swap C perspective, which is going to be very important. Now we know why we need to cool uh, or, or how we might start cooling these high power density electronics. Why do we need another standard when there's an existing air flow through standard? I gave you, you know, one reason earlier uh, that that wedge lock, uh, uh, you know, not having that in place. Um, but uh, the other big reason is uh, we don't have a 3U AFT standard right now. We don't have a standard that, that, that uh, allows 3U AFT. And 3U is becoming, as I think everybody in this room is aware, very popular on uh, swap C constrained platforms like UAVs, UUVs, and helicopters. Uh, and I might say even swap C squared, so size, weight, power, cost, and cooling. So optimizing all five of those, uh, you know, not independently, but together to try and come up with the most, with the best and most affordable cooling solution. And that's what we're intending to do with Vita 48.8. Um, we're including the 3U form factor, which is popular on those platforms we just saw. Uh, this is going to be a truly open standard. There's no essential IP to license. Um, we're going to, uh, from a, a weight reduction and cost savings perspective, we, I talked about uh, you know, not having the wedge lock, that helps to save weight and cost. Uh, we're also looking at the, the inserter extractor and not having that in place to help save weight and cost. Uh, one of the key elements here, well actually I'll talk about uh, that on the next slide, uh, you know, getting rid of that wedge lock, what it allows you to do with the chassis. Um, the last point on this slide that I wanted to talk about is the alternate airflow intake. Uh, I've got a slide here for a 3U module where this is um, not necessarily as beneficial as on a 6U. So just imagine this is a 6U. We don't have a drawing of the 6U yet, so I had to pop in the 3U one. Uh, you know, typical, uh, our, the existing airflow th uh, standards and most airflow implementations, you've got air flowing from right to left or left to right across the module. So with a 3U module, you can see that's pretty, you know, you, you don't have a lot of preheating length. But in a 6U module, if you have two processors, you're preheating that air and the downstream processor is going to be significantly hotter than the upstream processor. An airflow arrangement such as what you're seeing here where you're taking in cool air from both ends and then exhausting it out the top, as you can imagine, brings in the same temperature air to both processors. So that's going to be uh, pretty beneficial to 6U. Um, so uh, Vita 48.8 is being, uh, being introduced and brought to you by Curtis Wright as well as Lockheed Martin. Uh, who's actually implemented this, uh, this approach for a number of years on custom electronics and, and is bringing it in, in uh, partnership with Curtis Wright to the Vita standards arena for, for COTS implementations. Um, uh, a parallel news release uh, that's, that uh, is being sent out today is that Curtis Wright will be demonstrating the, new, the, the first uh, 3U AFT VPX COTS implementation of, of, of this. And this is why I have my... And speaking of cost reduction, I don't have a lovely assistant to do that for me, so I'm doing it myself. But um, this is, uh, some of you may have seen this yesterday, and, and for those of you in the press who want to take a closer look at that, uh, feel free to come in and see us afterwards. Uh, one of the, um, I'll get to this slide here. So to talk about some of the benefits that I mentioned earlier and, 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 and uh, you know, concretize them a little bit. Uh, swap C savings, uh, the, the getting rid of that wedge lock and allowing air to do its job on just the modules allows you to, to experiment and use different types of materials for the chassis uh, itself. You no longer need a highly thermal conductive chassis. 
you can use, uh, for example, 3D printed plastic chassis, which is what we've done here. And uh, you know, people have actually deployed uh, 3D printed plastics in harsh environments, uh, things like laser sinter nylon, for example. So that's, gonna, that's a promising approach uh, for uh, the weight reduction. Um, you know, we've, we're using 3U uh, VPX LRMs, or line replaceable modules, which is a, a well-established approach for two-level maintenance. And there are a number of cost savings that we've designed and manufactured into the modules as well as the chassis that, uh, that uh, we've, uh, um, we can talk about. Um, one of the aspects of this that we're really excited about is getting back to the, that power density uh, discussion we had earlier, is the ability to cool those power densities of around 200 watts per square centimeter. Um, these, these three UAFT approaches uh, allow you to do that without implementing uh, some of those exotic and expensive uh, cooling technologies that, like we saw earlier, the, the vapor chamber heat spreader or the nano spring uh, thermal interface material, or for that matter, liquid flow through. Um, the AFT in both three U and six U implementations promises to be uh, sufficient for the large majority of embedded processors uh, for the foreseeable futures, as well as the, the large majority of 3U and 6U COTS modules. So we're pretty excited about, uh, about bringing this um, into Vita. So I won't go through all of these bullets, but this is a, a summary slide I put together with the main points I've talked about, uh, just as kind of a handy reference for, for any questions or, or any discussions. And this is uh, the point at which I'll open it to the floor.